Uh, let's see today's progress. I always try to do a little bit on the car every day just to keep going. Uh, at the moment it's easy because I've got lots of little bits and pieces to be working on. So this morning the tungsten burrs I ordered arrived. Um, instead of the little tiny three millimeter Dremel sized ones I went for quarter inch ones that I could run in my air die grinder and that worked a lot better. Um, and they made really short work of finishing off the hole for the um, brake pedal shaft. So I've done that and I was looking at the adjuster here. Um, these come in all different sizes and lengths and things but the mechanism is the same and I just realized that on this one on the actual screw here there's meant to be a, a sort of um, on this captive nut there's a sort of ridge in the middle of it uh, a, a sort of dip in the middle of it sorry and on this fixed block there's a little ridge I can show that better in a second so that this kind of has a an indent action you can sort of hear it there um, but this one isn't very good it's quite worn out so I went through my box of spares again and discovered I did have a better one that's also shorter so it'll move that adjusted down um, below the steering column which I think will be better. This is a reverse thread and these things often seem to be bent. Um, this one definitely was bent so I was able to uh, just straighten that just on the press. It'll focus on it. Um, I just used some some plastic, hard plastic blocks. Uh, it's quite springy, so you actually have to press it, support either end, and then press the middle down a little bit further, and then let it spring back. But I was able to get this nice and straight again, and uh, you can see possibly in there. Hard to know where this will focus. There's the little the little step and the little indent that it fits into, and that's what kind of keeps the uh, the adjuster from moving. So there's a little bit of uh, tension on that when all the brake system, the brake cable's in place, and when you adjust it, that's what stops the adjuster just rattling around. So I'll swap over to this one. I want to plate all of these first. I'm still waiting for my bits and pieces to come before I do that. Uh, so that was all done. The other thing I did was this cover off. Um, I did swap over the rear camshaft bearing for the one that has the takeoff for the tachometer drive. I figured if I do this, uh, it then gives me the option of either using the mechanical drive or figuring out some sort of electron electronic drive which is difficult because it's off the magneto. Uh, you can get little uh, boxes that will take a signal from the magneto, but most of these seem to be from the states. And I haven't worked out if the magnetos are the same and if it'll actually work with my uh, BHT style magneto or not. Um, I think it, the difference comes down to if the windings are moving or if the coil's moving. I'm not sure if it really makes much difference. I have to figure that out. Uh, it also occurred to me that I didn't actually know on a magneto car like this how you stop the engine because the magneto is providing the spark of course and the um, it's purely driven mechanically and that's what's generating the spark. So to stop the engine there must be a effectively a kill switch the same as on a little two-stroke motor or a lawnmower or something like that that'll earth out the um, I'm guessing the points in that magneto and that's what stops the spark which will stop the engine. So that's something I need to look into because that's going to be rather important I guess. The other thing I did with this was I talked up the um, Conrod bolts to the proper torque. So these arrow Conrods use ARP bolts and basically the way you're supposed to set these up is via stretch, not via torque. So I figured out which bolts I have. It's actually marked on the conrods. There's um, lettering on there and it shows what they are and the measurements match up. 
and uh, let me see I'm sure I can do this with one hand I will stop this for a sec and just tip this engine over so we can have a look at uh, what's actually in there back to this again uh, having the the engine mounted on the stand like this has just proven so so useful actually mounting it on the side like this so you can rotate the engine and get to, to any face of it um, it just makes assembling it so much easier and it means I'm going to be able to assemble the clutch while it's still on the engine stand but it also made doing up these big end bolts easier I initially had it tipped another 90 degrees so the bolts were, were facing up but you have to use um, a little stretch gauge to measure the, the stretch on them as you torque them up and that's what this is I had to get this from the States from Summit Racing uh, there were a few little problems with this so the the way this works it's, it's all done up at the moment but this bolt here actually has a little pin machined on the end which you probably can't see it's down inside there and what I found is on this engine with these rods this bolt wasn't long enough the pin wouldn't come up far enough to make accurate contact with the little dimple on the bottom of the bolt without any of this hitting so I had to hunt around for a longer bolt that I could just turn a little point on the end on the lathe and these are I think it's quarter inch UNF bolts and I don't have any um, because all the cars I work on are um, pre-war stuff most of my bolts and things are, are BSW or BSF and I don't actually have any bolts for for UNF I have a few little small leftover bits and pieces from BMG which uses some but I didn't have any long enough so what I ended up doing and what actually made it easier to use is I turned the bolt around that's the little lock nut on it and I just used a small ball bearing that's actually held in there just with grease at the moment it's not stuck in it's just grease holding it in place and this is much longer it, it sticks out much further so I was actually able to get down inside on the back or the bottom end of the bolt and the ball bearing would almost automatically find the little dimple and center itself which made this so much easier to use when I first started using it I was using it vertically like this but the problem then is the weight of the thing was affecting the reading so what I found in the end was it was much easier to uh, to do it sort of sideways so that would fit in there just don't want to bang that down and then that would fit in there and then that would let you measure the the bolt stretch um, but even then I found it difficult uh, to you can see it's it's very fiddly to get it lined up exactly right so you kind of have to wiggle it around and see where the zero point is and then uh, reset the dial and then measure the stretch from there and I wasn't too certain I was doing that correctly uh, the the instructions also give a, a not recommended torque figure so they say this is the proper way to do it but here's a torque figure if you need to use a torque figure and that was uh, 60 Newton meters and what I found is after I'd done the stretch with this uh, it was pretty much 61 or 62 um, on my uh, torque wrench there I, I went up very slowly to start with until I was confident I was doing it right so going up sort of one newton meter at a time and they all ended up being the same which was um, 61 so 61 62 so more or less the same I think that's close enough the recommended figure was 60 so I know I'm all completely in the right ballpark and everything should be fine um, the other thing of course is these these ARP rods and things I think this is what the sort of stuff they use for racing and I'm not going to be racing this and it's not really a that hotted up engine so you know it's not going to be going insane speeds or anything so I think that should all be fine I can't imagine those coming undone now uh, the next thing will be the flywheel but I think I'll leave that for tomorrow night um, 
and I also still need to make up all the brake piping. Uh, I keep stopping and cleaning up, tidying everything up, putting everything away, and it doesn't seem to take long before everything becomes a real mess again. So I think it's going to be another, another tidy up first, and then I'll do the rest tomorrow or the next day. Today after work, I have fitted the flywheel. Um, I've heated this up in the oven in the house up to about 150C, um, let it sort of cook there for a while, and then using my big heavy gloves, I came and slotted it in place and did up the, the nut, making sure the woodruff key's in there as well, of course. I used some Loctite on the nut. I'm not sure if that's really necessary and talked this up to about 150 foot-pounds. I think the number is meant to be around 140 to 160. Um, my torque wrench only goes up to 150 and I did it to 140 and it sort of felt like it would go a little bit further so I took it up to where it sort of felt about right. Um, that's on there good and tight. And to stop it rotating I borrowed Mr Tweed's idea uh, but simplified it a little bit and just made this plate with the little piece of angle welded to it and I didn't even actually bolt it in place I just put these uh, up there. Oops. 3 8 bolts um, they just need to needed to drop through the holes and that was enough to hold everything in place you don't actually have to bolt them up and I had the engine rotated so the flywheel was vertical so when I was talking it up I was pushing down. Um, that's quite a lot of torque on that nut so if you tried to do it like this you'd just move the engine stand around. So being able to tip it so the engine was in its normal position meant I could, I could push down against the ground. And that seems to have gone on fairly well. Uh, there's about, what's that? eighth of an inch gap between the back of the flywheel and the uh, the back of the crankcase housing which I think is right I'm not exactly sure I haven't seen a measurement for that but uh, it does pull down the taper quite a long way in the books they talk about fitting these um, using grinding paste to lap them in I didn't actually do that on this one because the flywheel has been machined and the crank is brand new and machined and I didn't really want to risk messing it up so the tapers on those are good I know that they fit really well so I think we should be good with that so the next thing to do is fit the clutch uh, well first I have to fit the uh, the little bearing this fits in the end here this is all still pretty warm um, I'll put a little bit of grease on that before I put that in place which is why I want all of this to cool down first that's what the input shaft of the gearbox rides in. Uh, so this has to go in first, which hides the nut. So if you take one of these apart, initially you're not sure exactly how the flywheel is held on. But it's underneath the sparing. And my clutch has all been balanced, of course, so I'm making sure I keep it all oriented the right way. It's all, it's all marked up and the flywheel's marked up. So I will replace the little balls in these um, sort of cage bearing things in here. They are meant to be kind of captive, but they do tend to fall out. But once the clutch is assembled, they can't fall out. So I'll, to assemble this, I'll just put a little tiny bit of grease in there. I'm not sure how long that'll last with all the forces on this when it's spinning. But uh, some grease in there will hold the bearings in place. I slide this on and I should be able to do up the clutch. Now, after everything's cooled down, I've got the uh, flywheel and clutch all assembled, making sure my balance marks are all lined up. Uh, there's new ball bearings and these little slider things. I'm not sure what you'd call those. And I also have the release bearing in place. And the way this works is there's a bearing down inside there, sort of a big thrust bearing. And this is kind of loose. There, there's no load on those bearings when this is released. You don't, you don't want that. You don't want those running all the time. So 
with this done up tight, there's actually clearance in there so that those bearings aren't being, being run all the time. And this just screws on. I've Loctited all that in place. And then, might be able to see it. Uh, maybe. In there, there's a little locking set screw. That's all Loctited in place as well. So I did all this up really tight. Uh, so that should be good. To get the clutch cover on, um, because you have to compress the springs, I just use two longer bolts and start off two longer um, longer bolts with nuts on them um, so that you can screw the bolt down and then you just tighten the nuts down to push this down. And then once you get it down far enough, you can get, get the, um, the proper size bolts in. And those are also Loctited and, and all done up tight. So that should all be good. Hopefully nobody now leaves a comment saying, oh, before you put the flywheel on, don't forget such and such. Um, I don't think so. I think I've got everything in place now, which means this rotating assembly um, is all done. So I, I can start now working on the oil piping. And it's probably a job for tomorrow or the weekend. One thing I did do... Uh, to line up the, um, the clutch plate that's down inside there is I dug out the really old parts gearbox that I've got. Uh, you can tell this one's been well battered. It's been all welded up there. Um, it's not in very good condition. It's probably been sitting in a field or something looking at the rust on it. But I was able to extract the gears. It's actually missing its back housing. It, it, it's never had that as long as I've had this one. But I was able to pull it apart and get the gear cluster out so I could actually pull off the input shaft and use that as the alignment tool. Um, you can see the little step on the end of the input shaft, which is what fits into that bearing. And when I assembled the clutch, I basically eyeballed it uh, because you can easily look down there and check and see how central it is. And I got it close enough, and then after I assembled it, I slid this down and just gave it a little tap on the back with a hammer and this corner's got a little um, chamfer on it and that was enough just to pull it all into alignment and then this just popped down into position. So I know that's all now aligned. But it's quite interesting having the gear cluster out of here. Uh, obviously the lay shaft is still inside there. Let me tip this up. Um, so that's the lay shaft down in there. All of those gears are fixed, of course. They all rotate together. This one here is reverse. Uh, you can sort of see how that engages there. That's where it's out of the way. And the way this works, obviously, is your input shaft comes in here, which is this one, and that's in constant mesh with this gear. And um, the output gear which is this one, is in constant mesh with that gear on the lay shaft. This isn't keyed to the output shaft, so I'm going to try and do this without getting all greasy, but it's not going to really be possible. The way this works, your input shaft rotates on this freely. There's actually a ball bearing that goes in the end there to take up that, that end thrust. Um, this shaft is splined, and this collar slides up and down on it, and this gear pair here, which is first and second gear, slide up and down on this spline. So you can see how this gear isn't attached to this output shaft. So for this to drive the output shaft, this has to be engaged. So you can see how that slots in like that. Um, there's no synchromesh on anything here, of course. So when you're changing gears and the gears are crunching, for third and fourth, that's what's crunching is, is these trying to slot into place. And let me take that off. So all the way back like that is um, third gear. So drives in through here to the big gear on the lay shaft, back to the end gear onto this which is keyed onto here now, so that'll drive the, the output. And then uh, 
top gear, fourth gear, which is effectively direct drive, these dogs here engage like that. And so now the whole thing's locked up. And then first and second, this goes to the middle position like that. And then this slides up and down on here to change which of these two middle gears you are engaged with. And that's what gives you your first and second gear. So um, it's kind of fascinating. I really like how gearboxes work. They're really quite interesting devices and pretty easy to understand once you see one in bits. Uh, differential gets a bit harder. I, I find those are, those are a lot harder to, to figure out in your head exactly what's happening. But, I mean, on this, you can, you can even see the gear ratios. So first gear is the smallest, then second, I think that's right, um, first, second, third, and then effectively fourth. No, that's not really quite right, but uh, you, you kind of get the idea. Um, actually, yeah, I think that's all wrong, but you can see the different ratios because of the different size gears, let's put it that way. But uh, I'll reassemble this and I'll just squirt oil over it. I don't want it to rust even though I'm not using it. It might be useful for other things um, or spare parts. So that's good. That's all now assembled. Whoops, my mess is getting bigger. Um, and everything still rotates on the on the engine, which is very good.